I'm Dennis Anderson along with Pamela Fish and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Would the state of Minnesota be better served by a nonpartisan legislative body? We're joined tonight by Republican and Democratic lawmakers who think it would. In light of President's Day this week, we remember the summer that brought the White House to the Brule River in northwestern Wisconsin. And we'll have the week's business headlines and bring you a news file story from 25 years ago. That's all coming up next on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. Pamela Fish in here filling in for Julie this week. Pam, welcome That's back. That's right. Well, glad to be here. Thanks, Denny. You bet. We've got a rather interesting political discussion coming up. We do indeed, so let's get started. Up until the 1970s, candidates running for the legislature in Minnesota did so without party affiliation. With partisan bickering and gridlock seeming to get worse each year, some lawmakers believe a return to a nonpartisan legislature would be good for the state. Joining us to talk more about this idea is Representative Jim Knobloch, a Republican from St. Cloud, and Senator Roger Reinert is a Democrat from Duluth, and thanks to both of you for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I want to start with you, Representative Knobloch, and uh, ask you why you introduced this bill, first of all, and uh, what your overall intentions are with it. Well. Sure. First of all, I've believed in this concept a long time. You know, I, I'm, I'm the most uh, experienced freshman down there because I actually got elected in 1994, served for 12 years, uh, decided to not run again, and then got elected in 2014. And back sometime in my first run, I actually introduced this bill, although I never really got anywhere with it. But uh, having seen the change in the last 10 years, it just seems a lot more partisan to me. Seems like it's even harder to uh, get things done. I mean, I actually hear people talk about, well, you went out to dinner with a Democrat. I mean, <laughs> how, you know, how bad is that? Uh, you know, it's just ridiculous. And so I, I thought I would take another run at it, but try to push it a little bit harder this time. Two different politicians from two different parties in the state. Uh, Senator, why do you think the art of compromise has died? You're both trying to target in on the same issue. Sure, and you know, I think a little bit from my background as a civics teacher, We've gotten to this point where instead of politics being the work of the people, how we get work together to get things done, it's become this form of entertainment. And in, in this form of entertainment, my team is always good, your team is always bad. You know, it's just like in a sports analogy, you know, we, we push to victory and someone has to win and someone has to lose. And this idea that you could even associate, you know, uh, let alone maybe be friends with somebody on the other team and come up with a good idea together does really seem, I think, even in my eight years in the legislature to, to become you know, much, much more rare. Gentlemen, is there a danger that the public just doesn't care anymore if this keeps on <laughs> like we're doing? Well, I do think that this uh, drives bitterness, it drives rancor with the public too, it drives apathy, and I think that you know, it's important to have the public involved, and if they're, they're not involved, I think it actually just makes things worse. An apathetic public just doesn't expect anything from you anymore. Well, that's true, but also beyond that, an apathetic public isn't involved in right. the, uh, the uh, process of uh, finding new candidates, of uh, working, and so you end up with uh, only a very, very narrow group of people who are actually involved. Sure. And it, I, it would be interesting to see from the representative's perspective of having the bigger window of time. I think what the biggest thing that I have seen is just those who are involved are on the ends of the spectrum. You know, that vast, broad middle doesn't really engage with us anymore. I, I don't know if they're not expecting to be able to engage because they think it's become so defined by the ends of the political spectrum because that's what they see and hear. But I've seen that just in my yeah. eight years in the legislature. I'm sure you're not the only ones who have seen this. Uh, you are the only ones, though, that we know of right now who are introducing this legislation. And 
You tried for it last year, but it didn't go anywhere. Um, what's going to get it to move forward this time around? Well, I guess from my standpoint, I introduced it last year, but I had a lot going on last year with my other uh, job doing budget work as the chair of the Ways and Means Committee in the House. And traditionally, election bills often, you know, are constitutional amendments, big changes maybe go in the second year anyway. And, and let's face it, this is not going to pass into law this year. A big change like this, I believe, is the sort of thing that you have to start the conversation somewhere. And that's what I'm going to try to do this year. Start the yeah. conversation, get a hearing, get people thinking maybe next session or so something will happen. Did either of you get any pushback from party leaders well, saying don't go here, don't touch this? I did not, but I also introduced mine past our committee deadlines with the intention of having some conversation over the interim and maybe looking at it uh, this year. You know, I think it's important for everyone to remember that even when the legislature ran as nonpartisan, when legislators came, they still caucused with political parties, but the identity was not as fixed. And that made a big, big difference. It wasn't as team oriented. Yeah. You know, people had leanings. So it was more like my experience when I was on the city council here in Duluth. You know, we knew sort of where people were at, but building the relationships with everyone mattered because that's how you got things. Our done. younger viewers tonight may not realize that at one time, up until the mid 1970s, sure. there wasn't party designation. For most of the state's history. That's correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and you know, even back then, I mean, they did caucus, I guess, I think it was in 1909 that they went to no party designation, and they did that up until the 1970s. I guess it was into the 50s before they actually started caucusing with separate groups, but I know they caucused as conservatives and right. liberals, but right. there were a lot of conservative Democrats that were in the conservative caucus, and there were a number of right. Metro Republicans that were in the Liberal Caucus, so it wasn't a straight party right. split. Right. Back to um, any reaction you've heard from the party. Mm -hmm. Oh, you, you know, from my standpoint, Nelson? well, I had a few people, you know, kind of like, you're what? And, <laughs> you know, I talked to people to get co-authors, and, you know, I have some co-authors, but there were a number that were like, not going to touch this with a 10-foot yeah. pole. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it's I haven't had a lot of pushback. I think there are people like Roger and I there that realize that, yeah, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and I would say my experience or perspective is, as we've talked about on the show before, I've built this Purple Caucus within yes, the Senate. Yes, you did, and, yeah. Right. You know, and that is mostly people that came out of a local government background, school board, city council, mayor. So, you know, I haven't had leadership say really anything about this, but what I know is that there's a newer generation, maybe returning generation of legislators who think something needs to change. And just, so the, just the, explain a little bit about the Purple Caucus sure. and how, what that is all about. Yeah, uh, Senator Jeremy Miller and I, Republican from Winona, got together a couple of years ago uh, and created this idea of Purple Caucus. We're not going to be red Republican or blue right. Democrat. We're going to be purple. Uh, and our slogan was, let's be Minnesotans first and, uh, and other labels second. The other labels matter. They're just not the first thing. Uh, and we spent a good deal of time sort of just getting to know each other, which really doesn't happen in the legislature anymore. And then last year, we tried to move forward some initiatives around transportation and, and a better government process. Mm -hmm. Would a nonpartisan legislature be really apt to compromise more? After all, there's still going to be conservatives and liberals. Well, I think... Yeah, there are going to be people that still align themselves because they've got different beliefs. But I think, first of all, I think people are going to be more open to other ideas. There isn't going to be this automatic, sure. oh, it was introduced by a Democrat. It right. must be a bad idea if you're a Republican or, or vice versa. And, but I think beyond that, you know, the current system, I think, also creates a situation where people get kind of lazy. It's like, oh, well, someone's... Uh, in my caucus and my party's introducing this bill. It must be okay. I don't maybe need to spend a whole mm -hmm. lot of time thinking about uh, how I'm going to vote on it. I'm just going to vote for it because it's a Republican bill or a mm -hmm. Democrat bill. And I think that if it wasn't that way, you'd get better laws yeah. because people would look at these things a little more carefully. I've heard concerns that this would bring out more special interests, potentially to try and influence candidates and elections. How would that be addressed? Hmm. I, I guess I don't perceive that to be a problem. You know, we're fortunate in Minnesota to have a high number of elected officials per capita. You know, we've got a fairly large legislature given our population. A House member represents about 37 and a half thousand. A senator, 
you know, just under uh, 90,000. That's actually less than I represented as a city councilor. I mean, legislators know their constituents. Constituents know their legislators, know their candidates. So, um, you know, Representative Knobloch can comment on his experience. I've never found special interest to be a big part of it, and I don't perceive that without the labels they would be either. In fact, it would put more onus on the candidate to get out and introduce themselves to people and make sure that the that voters knew who they were. Would, would term yeah. limits aid in compromise, or would that make matters worse? You know, I guess I've always been a supporter of term limits at some point, you know, 12 years, 14 years. I think you do have to have people there long enough that they uh, understand what's going on. But having said that, the people there, I, I think it, you can be there too long, but at the same time, uh, the people that are there longer, I think, maybe feel a little bit more confident in compromising, too. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing, though, with the seniority issue is that uh, seniority and committee assignments are often tied to parties and parties mm -hmm. in the majority. Mm -hmm. So is that an issue to take a closer look at when you're talking about not having a party affiliation? Well, you know, we are not the only state that has ever done this. There is one mm -hmm. other state, Nebraska, right. that uh, is nonpartisan. And mm -hmm. interestingly, the way they handle their committee chairs is they have elections. Mm -hmm. You are not appointed to be chairman or chairwoman of whatever. You are elected by the various members. Mm. And so there are other models to do this. Mm -hmm. And I, it's exactly, I was going to point to Nebraska as well. I've gotten a chance to know a couple of those legislators. And, you know, they would say it's almost, it, it's a, a large number of Republicans in the Nebraska uh, legislature, but they vote and Democrats chair committees because it's based on their respect and their experience and their knowledge. And so, I mean, it, it's a different, people still have identities, yeah. but those identities don't consume all. So there is precedence. You know it does work. Yeah. And obviously it did work in Minnesota for right. 65 years. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I would argue that actually it worked really well in Minnesota. I mean, you think back to where our state was in 1909, 1900. We were, if you look at the statistics of per capita income, things like that, really just an also-ran state like other Midwestern states. But somehow by the 1970s, we had really emerged to be one of the more prosperous leading states of the country. And I don't think it's entirely an accident that we had nonpartisan yeah. government during that time. And let's talk just briefly uh, before we run out of time about the upcoming session, which starts in March. Mm -hmm. And uh, what um, each of you see as the issues that are really going to get the attention of the voters. Well, the big issues, I think, at the legislature are transportation, the tax bill, and the bonding bill. Those yeah. will be kind of the three big issues. Now, there's other issues out there, but, you know, we didn't have as big of a transportation bill last year as we would have liked. I think everyone believes we need to put more money into it. Mm -hmm. It's coming up with a compromise and figuring out how to do that. Yeah. Yep. I would identify the same three things. The bonding yeah. bill certainly is the thing we're supposed to do in this short session, the first true short session we've had in quite some time. A tax bill did not get done last year, a transportation, a comprehensive tra transportation bill didn't get done either. So those yeah. are the three things. And that's, you know, in 10 weeks, that's probably the yeah. capacity of the legislature. There is race disparity in Minnesota when it comes time to income. Is that going to be addressed at all with the, by lawmakers? I think that that is something that we are going to do some work on. The speaker had appointed me as co-chair of this Economic Disparities Task right. Force. We had a couple of hearings. Uh, I think it was an awful lot to expect that we were going to come up with a solution in a one-day special right. session. But uh, having said that, I would be hopeful that we make some progress mm -hmm. on that issue. Any proposals being outlined to um, get at that? I know you, you have been kind of digging into it, uh, economic disparity, how it's tied to race. Well, I guess, you know, I think from our standpoint in the House, uh, we'd really like to see some progress on school choice. Uh, we feel that the achievement gap is a big problem in this state. Uh, you looked at inner city Minneapolis, St. Paul. You see success stories in private schools with minority kids, big success stories. Mm -hmm. And I guess we feel that we ought to allow them some ability to go to those places. Yeah. Can the legislature do anything at all to foster growth in minority-owned businesses? Well, I think we have a good track record of doing that. And in fact, I was going to build on what the representative was saying. You know, we have some models that work. And when we do uh, state funded projects, especially construction and trade projects, we've got a really good history of bringing in underrepresented populations, not just minority, but female as well, female owned businesses and trade groups, um, and launching people on very successful lifetime careers. And so that training to work model. 
uh, is something that we should consider as we explore these different mm -hmm. options. And I saw some good ideas from the Senate Democrats, too, that they had brought forward in these hearings that I think have some promise. Yeah. Senator, you're from St. Cloud. What does your area need immediately from the state legislature? Oh, what does it need? Well, I, I Other represent... Other money. <laughs> <laughs> I represent St. Cloud State. I represent the St. Cloud Technical and Community mm -hmm. College. So we always have higher ed issues there. They've got some uh, bonding requests. Uh, you know, that's always an issue. I've got a lot of state employees. I have the, the prison is in my district mm -hmm. down there, too. Uh, but, you know, beyond that, I do think that we also need some tax relief. We've got a big surplus. I think that... Uh, Doing some tax relief with that would help spur the economy as well. Mm -hmm. And Senator Reiner, uh, highest priority for Duluth this session? Well, certainly the bonding bill is going to be a big priority. We have several different projects from big ones like the Superior Street reconstruction sure. in downtown Duluth to small ones like the Lake Superior Zoo that's very near and dear to my heart. So to me, a successful bonding bill would be a win for Duluth. You District. think that downtown project will get the funding? I mean, Well, it's certainly the number one project yeah. for the city. Uh, the question is, can we get it all in, in this uh, bonding cycle? Sure. And I suspect yeah. we both said that transportation is a big, Absolutely. Uh, big priority for both of our districts. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you both have your work cut out for you, but we thank you very much for coming in and talking to us about some of the issues tonight. We really appreciate well, it. Thank you Great very to much. Be here. To see thank you. you. Thanks yep. Thank you very much. Yep. Now, let's dig into our News File archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. Flanked by his bodyguard, Governor Carlson arrived at the Duluth Airport to meet with Congressman Oberstar and Mayor Fido. The goal, to agree on one Minnesota Airbus proposal to, in effect, make it easier on Northwest Airlines to choose a Minnesota site for a multi-million dollar maintenance base. Right now, the Twin Cities and Duluth are competing with each other, as well as four other possible out-of-state sites. Talks continued for about an hour behind closed doors, with all parties looking pleased with the outcome. We had a very, very good meeting, really. Uh, one, we wanted to understand the Duluth proposal. I think it's a good proposal. Two, we're going to sit down with the Metropolitan Airports Commission, and we're going to try to make sure that Minnesota comes in with one proposal, not two, and one that really is helpful to all parts of the state. The best package, does it sound like it'll be a Duluth package or a Minneapolis package? It sounds like it's a Minnesota package. But Congressman Oberstar remains most optimistic about Duluth's chances. Duluth's proposal makes the best sense for Northwest from a competitive standpoint. It's the best proposal for the state of Minnesota. It relieves a number of difficulties that are now being experienced in the Twin Cities at the major uh, international airport of congestion, noise, and uh, cost of uh, facilities. Schools and government offices were closed this past Monday in honor of President's Day. The White House may seem far removed from the Northland, but nearly 90 years ago, northwestern Wisconsin spent a summer as the epicenter of political power in the U.S. Tonight, we look back on the summer of 1928, when President Calvin Coolidge spent three months on the Brule River. In Superior, the Central High School Library was being converted into the country's executive offices. An enormous desk, fit for a president, was placed in the center of the room, flanked by an American flag and a bust of Abraham Lincoln. These spacious accommodations were even larger than Coolidge's White House office. At last, the day arrived, June 13, 1928. Local residents awoke to overcast skies, but that didn't stop throngs from making their way to the Omaha Depot in Superior to greet the president. All of Superior's stores and offices were closed that morning to mark the arrival, as was Duluth City Hall. At 9 a.m., right on schedule, the honored guests appeared. And right on cue, the skies cleared, showering sunshine on the celebration. Local dignitaries jockeyed for position, 
hoping to shake the president's hand or get their photograph taken with him. The crowd was thrilled when the first lady, who had been ill, appeared on the train's platform and warmly waved to the excited group. She accepted a bouquet of roses, then retired into the rail car to rest and continue her trip to Bruel. Meanwhile, the president had a parade to attend. Thousands of people lined the streets, hoping to catch a glimpse of the popular commander-in-chief. The president of the United States drove right by the front of my home. And I can remember so well being out in the front yard, and he was came uh, by our home in an open touring car, black. There were, I can't remember the number of people in, in the car, but very, very few. There was no one walking along the side, you know. And it, the thing I'd like to have the public uh, understand, it, it symbolizes for me the difference then and now as far as worry about crime, uh, worrying about safety. There weren't any bulletproof cars needed, you know. Just open space. And uh, it was a different world. Coolidge switched to a closed car on the outskirts of Superior, and the motorcade headed to Brule, towards the quiet seclusion of Cedar Island Lodge. Each community the Coolidge's visited met the first family with pomp and circumstance. Their Iron Range tour was a prime example. They toured the Hull Rust Mine. And visited Hibbing's Crown Jewel, its ornately designed high school. Then it was off to Virginia, where the presidential motorcade passed slowly through town on its way to the Masabi Mountain Mine. Coolidge watched as powerful locomotives slowly moved heavy ore from the pit. It was a memorable occasion for Iron Range residents and for their president. On September 10, 1928, the Coolidge's bid farewell to their river paradise. That rainy day, hundreds gathered in Superior to see them off. A sea of umbrellas stretched out before the president as he said his last goodbyes, praising the region that he had come to know and love. I have had an opportunity to see something more of this locality and this region than I have had in the past. It is a vigorous, enterprising, growing region, and you may well be proud of it. You have secured a development in 40 or 50 years that others have taken centuries of effort to accomplish. It is a satisfaction to me as President of the United States to see a wonderful development of that kind and realize that this great empire is part of this nation. And with that, Northern Wisconsin returned to normal. Time now for a look at the week's economic stories from the folks at Business North. There was a high level of construction activity last summer at SR Steel, Minnesota, but it has all but stopped. Mitch Brunfeldt, SR's Director of Government and Public Relations, told Nashwalk City Councilors last week that just 20 to 30 workers are currently on site. The company has again run short on funding, which also ground the project to a halt in 2012. 
Brunfeldt emphasized that unlike the first work stoppage, the project is now three quarters of the way to completion and he said we can see the finish line. Duluth-based Elite revealed it wants to exit the property sales business. The corporation has two major development projects in Florida, but both have lost money in recent years. Now to leave that business segment, Elite indicated it would be willing to sell its entire portfolio in bulk, perhaps below book value. Proceeds would be redirected to support growth in its energy-related ventures. During Elite's fourth quarter of 2015, it took a non-cash impairment charge totaling $22.3 million on its property holdings. Increased regulatory demands have forced Enbridge Energy to delay the completion of its proposed Sandpiper pipeline and its Line 3 replacement project by two years. Costs for the projects also will increase, Enbridge said in its 2015 year-end report. Project opponents have been vocal in raising their concerns. The Minnesota Court of Appeals has required the company to complete an environmental impact statement before the certificate of need and route permit processes can begin. The company says work on the project is expected to add more than $2 billion to Minnesota's economy. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. And if you have a comment on this week's show, this is the time to call. Dial 218-788-2849 and leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdse.org. And visit the WDSE website for the latest updates on your favorite programs, news about the station, and more. And Pam, thanks again for being here. We'll see you back here next week, too. Yes, I'll be here one more time this okay, month. Okay, it'll be good to have you there, too. Okay, thanks. Finally tonight, you may have seen some video of ice stacking that received a lot of attention on social media this week. Now, this video you're looking at right now is a similar phenomenon, which tends to occur whenever ice forms on Lake Superior and the wind begins to blow. This video was shot by WDSE's Ted Pellman, who has been documenting natural forces on the big lake for decades. Thanks for watching again this week. For Pamela Fish and the crew here at Almanac North, I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend. Good night, everybody, and be kind.